Hi, good afternoon, morning and evening to all who are joining us today for this webinar, Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures, TCFD. Where to start and why do I need to disclose? Brought to you by the Energy Studies Institute, National University of Singapore and ERM. We are grateful for the response and interest in this topic and we look forward to a lively discussion later. My name is Melissa Lowe. I'm a research fellow at the Energy Studies Institute, National University of Singapore, and I have the pleasure of being your host and moderator today. Before we begin, uh, I just have some quick administrative details for you. We have the next slide. Yes, great. At this, as this event is set up in a webinar format, participants are not able to raise their hands on mute to ask questions. So in order for us to begin promptly during the Q&A later, please, pose your questions using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. If you wish, you may also mention who you would like to direct your questions to. And I'm sure many of you already have questions coming into this webinar. Please do keep them brief and post them uh, in the box. You may also upvote questions you want answered by our panelists and we'll be able to get to them sooner. Please note that we'll be recording this webinar for internal purposes. And of course, I'm anticipating this question by participants. I'm happy to share that the presentation materials will be made available after the webinar. We've also enabled the English transcript feature. So you can click on the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and to show subtitles if you need to. There will also be a short survey at the end of the webinar, so don't leave us on the dot. Uh, if you have any additional questions or thoughts about the webinar, you can use that link to send them to us. One final admin note, if you face any technical difficulties at all during the webinar, you may contact myself or my ESI colleague, Bradley Ho, via the chat function. Okay, let's begin the event proper. Today, we have a distinguished lineup of experts here to share on the Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. They will give us an overview of TCFD and share some best practices and Singapore examples. The speakers will explain what TCFD developments mean for, for companies and how TCFD can be used to help companies incorporate climate-related risks and opportunities into their risk management and strategic planning processes. We will first begin with Yulia Dubrolova, followed by Sina Dabral, and then Robin Kenish from ERM. And we also have Esther Ahn, Chief Sustainability Officer with City Developments Limited. Uh, I will briefly introduce our speakers. I think many of you will have seen their, their CVs or their resumes on our uh, webinar uh, website, but let me just introduce them very briefly. Yulia is a partner at ERM leading corporate sustainability and climate change practice in Asia. She has 15 years experience in consulting and managing projects on climate change, clean energy, and sustainable development. Sina is a consulting director at ERM leading corporate sustainability and climate change services in Singapore. She has guided a range of clients in Singapore and within the region on climate change risks spanning across various sectors and specifically within energy, transportation, and finance, including working with multi-sectoral multi clients on international standards, including TCFD and other environmental guidelines and standards. Robin is the Director of Corporate Sustainability and Climate Change Services at ERM. He has over 25 years of experience in advisory and consulting services around climate disclosures, including CDP and TCFD, as well as for renewable energy projects. Esther, I think many of you know Esther, she has been an active advocate for green building and sustainability for over two decades and instrumental in establishing CDL's leadership in sustainability. It's also extremely timely to hear from Esther since CDL was recognized yesterday as the only Singapore company to be listed on the 2021 CDP A list and the only company in Southeast Asia and Hong Kong to be listed for four consecutive years. So, so welcome to all of our speakers. Each of you will have 15 minutes, thereabouts, and then we will go into a 10 minute uh, Q&A at 3.50 p.m. To help our speakers understand our participants here today better, we have three introductory polls that we'd like you to participate in. So may I please invite Bradley to initiate the polls. So question one, which sector do you represent? You can pick among the options available. Which sector do you represent? Okay, we'll give you a few seconds to answer. 
Okay, let's see um, the answers now, please. Oh, not yet. Do we not have any? <laughs> Do we not have any uh, answers at all? We didn't give enough time, I guess. Okay, so some people are saying they can't uh, try to answer. Okay, perhaps we can try again, uh, relaunch the poll. Ah, okay, I see the answers going now. Great. Thanks everyone for being patient with us. Okay, which sector do you represent? Okay, we've got about 43 people out of 51 participating, great. Okay, so I think quite a number of you come from the financial services sector, followed by oil and gas, power, and then a small fraction from mining and metals, great. Okay, let's have the next question. Oh, and then we have others as well, okay. Um, the next question is, where are you in your TCFD journey? Where are you in your TCFD journey? Okay, very interesting answers here. Um, I'm sure the speakers are taking note of this. Okay, I can see that close to 40% have just started the TCFD journey, either having done their first disclosures or just preparing to. And then we have about 33% who say they don't know and 17% saying that they've not started about planning to. Okay, so I think this, that's a good mix of you here today. And, and the last question for you today that will help our speakers in their preparation, uh, which geography does your business operate in? Singapore, Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific, or global? I can already see that um, global is starting to get quite a lot of votes, and then followed by Southeast Asia, Asia Pacific, and then Singapore. Okay, all right, it's a very good mix. Uh, welcome and thank you again for your interest in this webinar. Okay, we can stop the poll now. Okay, thank you all so much for your participation in our poll. Uh, that was really helpful for me and I'm, I'm certain it's helpful for our, our presenters today as well. Without further ado, may I please invite Yulia to start her presentation. Thank you very much, Melissa, and good afternoon, everyone. And today, before we go into uh, uh, TCFD details. Let me very briefly introduce uh, you to IRAM uh, for those of you who have never worked with us before. So IRAM is a pure sustainability consultancy firm and uh, we've been there for the last 50 years on the market, including over 25 years in Singapore and Southeast Asia. And one of the interesting things, IRAM was a sole consultant that was engaged by the task force for climate related financial disclosures, or TCFD, to support the development of the scenario analysis supplement. Today we'll speak about TCFD and its recommendations and approach to scenario analysis in a bit more detail. Thank you, and let's move on. So we'll start off with a a little bit of a background of what happened just recently at the United Nations Climate Change Conference in Glasgow. On the next slide, you will see some of the key decisions that were taken just recently in November. And it's really important for us to understand that because those decisions would pretty much drive the global climate actions as well as um, actions in our region and in Singapore in particular. First and foremost, there was a global recognition by countries of the need to achieve net zero targets by 2050 and shorter term targets by 2030. With that idea in mind, in the next year, countries around the world will be updating their nationally determined contributions, their climate targets, uh, with uh, the intention to increase the ambition. And obviously that would translate into more stringency and new regulations for businesses and financial sector organizations that operate in respective countries. 
The second point that is particularly linked to our discussion today is the understanding of importance of timely assessment and management of climate related risks and timely adaptation plans. And earlier this year, actually, in addition to COP26, there was an important milestone report published by Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, which talks about the most recent scientific updates and related uh, climate projections and possible climate risks that was also adopted at the recent COP26 um, conference. Uh, this report also gives a new set of scenarios that will be particularly helpful in your climate risks assessments going forward. There were some other decisions uh, quite critical for uh, not just respective sectors, but the broader uh, economic uh, sectors and industries because they touch upon energy. And obviously energy production or use uh, is very relevant to various industries and sectors around the world and uh, in our region in particular. These decisions include phase down of coal, a commitment by 40 countries around the world, including Indonesia as one of the key regional players in our part of the world in the mining sector to, to really cut down on, uh, on coal and uh, ensure it in a just manner. There were commitment around methane emission reductions, support for clean and affordable technologies, and many other decisions. On the next slide, um, I would like to reiterate the important point that today climate change is considered as one of the important and material risks by the financial sector in the first place. And it is understood that it's one of the most likely to happen and impactful investment risks, but at the same time, least understood. And with that idea in mind, uh, the whole TCFD framework, which we will talk about today, was uh, developed. Here on the slide, you can see some of the key climate-related drivers on the left-hand side, which include not only physical climate impacts coming from the increased frequency and severity of climate-related natural hazards, such as cyclones, droughts, um, and others. It's also a whole set of drivers linked to the low carbon economy transition. And obviously the sooner our world is transforming and uh, embarking on the net zero pathway, the more impactful those uh, drivers would be for many businesses. They also can bring certain opportunities and that's why also the addressing climate related risks and opportunities and the timely assessment could be also beneficial for your businesses. Another important message from this slide is that uh, the impacts coming from those climate related drivers can be various and actually they can be uh, quite impactful and material for all sectors, regardless whether you have actual, actual physical assets or if you're online business. If you look deeper into your overall value chain, definitely there will be impacts upstream or downstream regardless of your type of and nature of business. And the last but not the least, the slide also illustrates how those impacts on your operations and value chains can be translated into impacts and risks for the financial sector. And that's why actually this whole climate risk agenda is pretty much driven by the financial sector these days. Next slide, please. So what's actually TCFD? The CFD stands for the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. It was established back in 2015 under the uh, Financial Stability Board of the Group of 20. It is a framework for consistent and transparent disclosures around climate risks assessment and management. And if you look at the four pillars of the TCFD framework, governance, strategy, risk management, metrics, and targets, it's pretty much about how your business, how the governance structures of your business, your business strategy, your risk management processes, and your business-related metrics and targets integrate climate considerations. And one important distinguishing point of TCFD compared to other ESG frameworks, it's not about how your company impacts the climate change. It's pretty much the other angle how TCV looks at, at the things. It's how climate change impacts the resilience of your business going forward in the short, mid and longer term perspective. 
So that's under that angle, we should consider to see in the first place. Next slide, please. So in the scenario analysis supplement to the TCMD recommendations, which IRAM developed, uh, we have suggested a simple, uh, but uh, quite helpful six step approach to climate risks and opportunities assessment. And first thing I should mention here, it's a continuous improvement process. So ideally, the, these six steps would need to repeat uh, every year uh, with the increased level of depth and uh, stringency in terms of the climate risks assessment. The first and most important step is actually to get your teams, internal teams and functions uh, on board for climate risks uh, topic and climate action. And that's why the governance is also the first pillar in the TCMD framework. So internal engagement, internal capacities and awareness uh, we see as the first and foremost step in every TCMD process for any organization. The next step is typically to assess materiality of climate related risks to select those that are most relevant for your sector. Step number three is scenario analysis, which many companies are particularly uh, worried about how to do it. And this is where you look into how those material climate related risks can behave over time and the different scenarios and what could be the range of the impact. Step number four is to identify what could be those business impacts under different scenarios. Step number five is to identify potential response measures and most importantly, integrate them into your processes, systems, and uh, strategy, business strategy. And the last point, but not the least, of course, is to disclose because TCFD is pretty much about disclosures in the first place. Next slide, uh, just briefly illustrates you um, the approach to scenario analysis. Um, obviously for this kind of topic, we need a, a whole set of webinars, not just one uh, short uh, slide. But just briefly, there are of course various scenarios out there uh, published by reputable institutions and organizations such as IPCC and uh, for example, International Energy Agency could talk about transition scenario. What's important under TCFD, you need to look into range of impact. That's why ideally you would need to take at least a couple of scenarios to see what different futures could be and what uh, the range of impacts could be for your organization. If we talk about physical risks, the most important scenario to look at would be the, the worst case scenario actually, where the temperature goes as high uh, as uh, the projections um, say. Because if your organization can prepare for the worst case scenario and the highest climate impacts, then you can uh, prove the resilience for even milder scenarios. For transition risks, the other way around, you would need to look into the net zero future and the low carbon scenario where the technologies adoption, the market shifts would be the most dramatic and how those could impact your business and value chain. Lastly, um, I would like to highlight um, on the next slide, uh, this uh, TCFD disclosure is really a journey. And based on our ERM experience with various clients in the financial sector and with the uh, business organizations, we found out that typically this journey takes uh, two, three years. Uh, and we see a lot of organizations during the first year just addressing the foundation uh, doing the qualitative assessment of climate related risks, setting the governance uh, systems in place and understanding what the future scenarios um, and impacts could be. While uh, digging deeper during the second and third year into quantitative assessments and integrating deeper climate considerations into strategies and business processes. Thank you very much. Um, and with that, I will pass it back to Melissa. Thank you very much, Yulia, for your sharing. Uh, I'd like to pass the time now to Sina. Thank you, Melissa. Thanks, Yulia. A very good afternoon to all the attendees, and thank you for taking time to listen to the session. Um, we will start off the Singapore angle with understanding. Um, next slide, please. We'll start off the Singapore angle with understanding why TCFD or climate related disclosure is critical for corporates in Singapore at this time. Uh, because climate change is a known fact and has become increasingly important for investors to understand the status of their investments, 
um, Singapore Exchange has proposed a roadmap in August 2021 towards mandating climate-related disclosures for listed insurers based on the recommendations of the TCFD. Um, now, what they're saying essentially is that all issuers would need to look into their climate risks and start reporting this um, in their sustainability reports from 2022 onwards. It is expected that companies would progressively adopt these practices, um, and hence a phased approach over a three-year period has been suggested. The consultation paper from SGX has um, identified the priority sectors uh, that would be affected. Uh, these are agriculture, food, uh, forest products, energy, materials, buildings, transportation. Uh, these are all, all, as you know, the high carbon emitters. Um, not going into too many details, the crust here is that aligning to TCFT recommendations, SGS is also proposing um, scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emissions to be disclosed and scope three to be disclosed if appropriate. This point on greenhouse gas emissions actually tie into the October 2021 updates from TCFT, um, which I will touch on later. So, um, in, in addition to uh, SGX, in, in December 2020, the Monetary Authority of Singapore finalized their guidelines on environmental risk management, and they recommend disclosures on an annual basis in accordance with international frameworks such as TCFD. Again, in May 2021, the, finance industry, the Green Finance Industry Task Force published an implementation guide for climate-related disclosures, which again adopts uh, TCFD's recommendations as the guiding framework for disclosure. So, so quite a lot happening um, in, within the regulatory landscape in Singapore. Next slide, please. So the financial regulators, lenders, investors, corporates, um, they all play a pivotal role for disclosing in the climate agenda. Um, regulators and investors are demanding transparency from the investments um, or potential investments on climate related risks and how that affects the financial position of the company. The corporates in turn are responding to this need and as of uh, November 2020, over 2,700 supporters have signed up, including investors and regulators. Um, we next slide, please. We got a uh, we we got a bit of background on Yulia on how TCFD works on disclosure related to the four pillars. Um, I wanted to give you some practical examples on what actions need to be implemented to satisfy disclosure under each of these pillars. Um, so under governance, you will need to make sure that there is board oversight to climate related risks and opportunities. Um, the company should push on a cultural revamp if needed, uh, develop policies around climate strategy, assign roles and responsibilities to management as well as senior leaders and develop a reporting mechanism as such. Under strategy, you would need to acknowledge climate change as a key risk and hence integrate that into your core business strategy um, and planning initiatives. You would need to develop scenario analysis to understand your risks. Um, so understanding your risks is analyzing and articulating data, which would be the physical and transition risks, and then integrating those into the company's overall risk management process. And last but not the least is metrics and targets, wherein it is extremely important to select your KPIs as well as your interim targets. So it is important to understand and disclose your emissions and align your portfolio to the 1.5 degree target by using these metrics. This actually leads on to the next slide. Um, so in October 2021, um, TCFD released updates in the form of a new implementing guidance. Um, this is important because in the new guidance, TCFD removed materiality assessment for scope one and two emissions, which means that these should be disclosed regardless of materiality since they make up the foundational pieces of information needed. Um, all sectors are also strongly discouraged, uh, encouraged to disclose scope three. Um, secondly, um, TCFD recommends uh, companies to look at transition planning. So if you are going to set targets uh, for short, medium, long-term plans, 
uh, then you need to uh, then you need to plan a plan to achieve these targets. So hence, companies would need to disclose current greenhouse gas emissions performance. They need to look at the impact of transition on business strategy and financial planning. And then, then they would need to disclose the activities and actions needed to support this um, transition. Next slide, please. OK, having said all that on TCFD, there are really five essential steps for corporate climate action. First, and the most important, is measuring your footprint. So understanding and measuring your scope one, two, three greenhouse gas emissions is critical first step for all the companies. Your starting point is measuring uh, carbon impact generated and avoided by your company's activities. Once we go on to the second point. So once you know your emissions, you need to set net zero or carbon neutrality goals with clear interim targets. So um, setting a target using an established methodology defines the company's ambition and provides a framework for delivery. And third is developing cost effective emission reductions pathway. Um, so developing cost effective emission reductions pathway is really defining the main elements of your net zero plan. So this would be um, identifying positive impacts of your activities, um, identifying best practices in terms of reductions, um, avoided or offset uh, greenhouse gas emissions, um, reducing energy. So often overlooked energy use and in efficiency initiatives are effective ways for business to reduce their uh, footprint and save money. And this is not taken into account a lot of times. Um, switching to low carbon economy. So uh, switching to renewable energy sources is at the heart of low carbon transition. And this helps companies shape the future energy markets. Um, one another way of defining the main, main elements of your net zero plan would also be uh, pursuing carbon removal solutions. So for most companies, achieving net zero will require taking advantage of carbon removal technologies, um, including offsetting nature-based solutions, carbon capture, utilization storage, and such. So that was, uh, that was number three. So number four is once um, your roadmap and pathway is ready, you need to integrate this into your business and your financial planning. And lastly, but not the least, since we are on that subject, is to disclose and integrate with TCFD, which would be the need from your stakeholders as well as your investors. Um, thank you all. And over to you, Robin. Thanks, Sina, for taking us through uh, the TCFD developments in S Singapore and also for breaking down the five essential steps for corporate climate action. Next up, we have Robin, who will share with us perspectives from the financial sector, and he will be bringing forward some case studies from Hong Kong. Robin, you have the floor. Great. Thanks very much, Melissa. We can move on to the next slide. Um, so the, the Hong Kong regulatory situation with regards to climate related impacts and the disclosure of those impacts has really evolved over the last two years. Um, back in 2020, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange issued their revised ESG reporting guide. Um, so it moved on from a compliant and explained situation to give um, more significance to, to several ESG KPIs, particularly one around climate related issues. Um, in a few months later in December, the, the Green and Sustainable Finance Cross-Agency Steering Group then announced that um, they wanted to have mandatory TCFD um, disclosures uh, by no later than 2025. Um, the emphasis was, though, the company should start disclosing as soon as they can um, and not leave it until 2025, but essentially use this intervening period as a way to, to effectively do what some of the th things that Yuli has outlined in terms of getting your governance sorted out and starting on your first, second and third years of disclosure. Um, in November this year, so just last month, um, they published a very detailed and extremely helpful guidance document on climate disclosures, essentially to help assist companies with this disclosure process. Um, it provides some specific guidance and some example disclosures for all four of the TCFD pillars. Um, and it does recommend the use, for example, of publicly available scenarios. So Yulia touched on um, what kind of scenarios you can adopt in your TCFD assessments, um, and it gives some guidance on that. In particular, it suggests that as a starting point, you have two contrasting scenarios, um, that you have a low emissions, very stringent pathway, which again would emphasize transition risks and their impact on your portfolio, and then a higher emissions or business as usual pathway, 
um, which may present more significant physical risks. So it refers again to, to publicly available scenarios that you can use, um, such as the um, IEA scenarios, um, and it also talks about the, the um, SSP scenarios, the shared socioeconomic pathway scenarios, which have been presented in the, in the recent IPCC AR6 report. Um, so good useful information to refer to there. Um, it, it does ask that you look at the financial impact of your risk and opportunities. And it again suggests that you adopt a materiality threshold that's appropriate to your business and that your, 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 your team are essentially comfortable with in terms of the disclosure for risks and opportunities. And then, and then, of course, it's all about setting targets, metrics and indicators, and then action plans and disclosure. And it gives some good examples of what kind of disclosure methods you could adopt um, to, to present that information. Sort of moving slightly ahead of the game, though, um, the, the asset managers and fund managers situation in Hong Kong. So the Securities and Future Commission um, amended their fund manager code of conduct um, quite recently, um, so that um, climate issues are taken into a much more explicit consideration in the investment and risk management processes. So this applies to any collective investment scheme. So unit trusts, mutual trusts, um, uh, the mandatory provident funds that we have for our retirement schemes, and also real estate investment trusts. Um, and essentially, you, you have sort of a flow chart to determine, first of all, are climate um, risks relevant to your situation? Um, so there's a process by which you, you want to look at the materiality of climate risk for your particular aspect or your particular funds. If you decide no, then they do recommend that on a yearly basis you review that um, based on any additional investments you've introduced to your portfolios. Um, if it is yes, that you do have some material climate risks, then again, it divides things into two different camps. So if you have less than 8 billion Hong Kong dollars assets under management, um, then it requires you take the baseline requirements. So the baseline requirements are, uh, I guess you would say, a slightly more straightforward disclosure, still mirroring the aspects of TCFD, um, but essentially it's much more focused around um, the governance aspects, um, how you look at climate risks and how you disclose them um, for the enhanced requirements. So this is much, for much larger funds. So this, if you're talking about 8 billion Hong Kong dollars, under asset management or more, then it does ask you to look at something like a portfolio scenario analysis. Um, it, does you, it does ask you to determine your scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions, and also if possible, your scope three emissions as well, or at least to have some process by which you are looking at that topic, um, and then to disclose the portfolio of carbon footprints at a minimum. So again, it's much more enhanced requirements for asset managers there. And I think the most, most interesting thing is the timeline. Um, so the baseline requirements need to be met by um, August of next year, so very soon. So all asset managers should really take that under, under real consideration. And then for enhanced requirements um, by November um, next year. So a much more advanced timeline than the, the stock exchange. So if we move on to the next slide, we've got some examples. So ERM's put together a few different ready to use methodologies, sort of scenarios that can be used for clients. So this could apply to a corporate analysis. So for example, um, looking at the company as a whole or the different products that the company produces. It could be a portfolio analysis um, where you might be looking at different risks and opportunities amongst the different sectors in your portfolio. And in particular, this might also incorporate different geographies. Um, so it allows you to look at not just sector-based issues, but also geographic-based issues as well. Um, and then finally, we also have, for example, like project analysis. Um, this is a particular scenario, for example, if your project is, is getting money from any of the equated principal banks, um, then you will be required to do um, a form of climate change risk assessment. And we have an example of what one of those would look like. So moving on to the next slide. So one good example um, of disclosure um, is from the CLP group. Um, CLP is a Hong Kong based but Asia footprinted power, power company. Um, they've got jurisdictions in Hong Kong, China, Australia, India, and Southeast Asia, quite a very different portfolio. Um, and if you've been to their websites or familiar with their business, they have quite a, an extensively published Climate Vision 2050. They've recently announced their own net zero targets. Um, and obviously that means they're, they're focusing a lot on decarbonizing, moving away from coal-based power to more renewable smart grids, et cetera. 
Um, so they've adopted TCFD since 2017, um, and they've been increasing the levels of disclosure um, that they present in their sustainability reports, which is their main vehicle for the disclosure of climate related impacts. Um, they've also contributed to the Utilities Preparer Forum. So this is an important point that there are many sector guides out there for companies to refer to. There are real estate guidelines, there are, sec there are power sector guidelines, chemical sector guidelines. So if you're unsure what kind of scenarios you should look at or what risks and opportunities are relevant to your business, then have a look for those sector-based guidelines because there's a lot of useful information. I mean, in fact, the WBCSD have just published one on the power sector, which is essentially compiling four years of experience in disclosures for the power sector um, and essentially sort of um, tips and tricks, if you like, from the power companies that were interviewed. And one of those included um, CLP. Um, in their recent disclosure in 2020, um, they've adopted three different scenarios. So they've gone a little bit further than the typical low carbon, high carbon scenario, where they adopted one which is called a deferred transition scenario. And this is quite relevant when you think about the outcomes from COP26, where we know that in the mid-century, um, and particularly around 2025, 2030, there's likely to be a ratcheting up of um, energy policies and much more stricter regulations around emissions. We know that businesses may have to adjust quite rapidly um, and there could be some significant disruption. So they've looked at that in their scenario analysis and then disclosed that in their sustainability report. We move on to the next example. Um, this is one for an APAC based global investment company. Um, so this company has various assets under management, again, in different geographies. Um, their geographies include across Southeast Asia, but also the US and Saudi Arabia. Um, they have various different sectors in their portfolio. Again, all of these different sectors have different risks um, of facing them from climate change, but they also have some significant opportunities um, for growth um, and revenue growth from climate change uh, transitions. So we looked at the, at the portfolio as a whole um, and essentially conducted some sector heat map exercises um, to look at what kind of opportunities there were for the different sectors and the different geographies over different timelines. Um, to essentially flag up to the client, okay, this particular sector has got some significant issues that could affect revenue um, negatively or positively, um, and then map those out against physical risk as well. Um, so the client essentially gets a heat map of their different sectors, and that allows them to then prioritize what their business action should be in response to this. Um, does it involve channeling funds away from particular types of investments? or channeling funds to them because there's lots of opportunities for future growth. So if we move to the next slide, um, this is essentially how the climate risk management process is then embedded into the investment tools. Um, so once you've done that kind of hotspot analysis, it means that you can then look at your investment strategy. You can focus on what type of risks and opportunities you want to look at under different scenarios. Um, you can then also implement the outcomes of this into your due diligence tools. Um, an increasing thing that we see now with clients is they're not just wanting uh, a standard sort of ES uh, DD approach, but they're also looking for a much more stricter look at typical ESG parameters and especially climate, um, so that they know that when they're investing in, in a particular asset, it is gonna be climate resilient and they don't have hidden costs associated with that coming forwards. This allows essentially you to review your investment portfolio regularly. Um, Yulia mentioned again that um, you, you need to be looking at your portfolios maybe every year, but at least every time new climate information is produced or there's new market trends taking place so you can see what impact that could have on your particular investment scenario. So if we move on to the next slide, this is sort of drilling down into projects themselves. So in Hong Kong and Singapore in particular, we've got lots of equated principles financial institutions that are investing in projects throughout Southeast Asia, India, and North Asia. Um, and now under the equated principles, clients are required to do a climate change risk assessment following the approach of TCFD. Essentially, again, reinforcing this topic of, is your project going to be resistant um, to the effects of climate change under different scenarios? So again, for larger types of projects, which we call category A's or category B's, um, we would do a physical review to see how resistant they could be for typhoons and floods, for example. Um, we would then also do a transition risk assessment 
particularly to see if the project is compatible with the host country national climate commitments, so the NDCs that you introduced earlier. If there's incompatibility there, then we know at some point over the next five, 10 years, there could be some issues about with that project being able to proceed, it could become a stranded asset. So that's something we want to be able to flag up in the due diligence process. So this provides a great tool um, that can be used for this, and it is now applicable to all projects um, that are category A or category B. So if we move to the, the final slide um, in this, oh no, we have an example, sorry. So this is a solar farm project where we actually applied um, this particular approach. Um, so we selected some scenarios and time horizons to look at the project. It's solar farm, it's likely to be operating for say 25 years. So we wanted to look in particular at flooding issues and storm surge issues, rising sea level issues, because the solar farm was located quite close to the coast. So it's very significant. In Singapore, we've got potentially large floating solar projects coming on board. Um, so again, you want to know that these projects are resilient to the, the effects of climate change. Um, so this involved developing a baseline, choosing the appropriate climate scenarios, modeling the effects on the infrastructure, and then assessing the resilience, then determining whether there need to be additional mitigation measures incorporated into the operation of that particular facility. We're now seeing quite a lot of this kind of uh, support required because we have had clients coming to us saying, you know, especially over the really terrible weather we've had over the last year, um, that their facilities have become flooded and they, they didn't know this. It wasn't flagged up as part of the BD they did a couple of years ago. And what can they do about this? So this kind of approach is designed to, to head that off at the pass and make sure you can plan for this as the project is developed. So if we go on to the next slide, I think the final point I'd like to mention is that all of this process around TCFD is, is becoming better the more you integrate digital technology into your strategies. Um, there's a huge amount of data gathering um, on your assets, um, on KPIs, for example, metrics and targets. And the, the more you use digital tools to gather that data, look at that data, particularly if you're talking about greenhouse gas emissions, then I think the, the, the more efficient your, your TCFD reporting approach will be. And particularly if you intend to do um, updating every couple of years or even disclose very detailed disclosures every year, the, a data management system will be quite integral to that particular point. So we would again suggest that you integrate the digital technology all the way from governments through to the operation of metrics and targets. Okay, great. Thanks, Melissa. So we hand over now to Esther. Thanks, Robin. Okay, yes, so last but not least, we have Esther Ahn, who will share with us CDL's journey with yeah. TCFD. Esther, please. Yeah, hello, and thank you for having me. And I think I can uh, compress my presentation because the three speakers have already done a lot about why TCFD. And uh, in fact, you know, for corporate, you know, we are all really trying to stay afloat in this hot soup of, you know, acrolim. TCFD is really the rising star, you know, and I'm, I'm going to share with you our, uh, in the next slides that why do we, you know, uh, embrace TCFD? Actually, we started embracing it since 2017 and um, amongst, you know, uh, in addition to quite a few of other acronyms as well, including like GRI, CDP, and, and whatnot. And uh, next slide, please. And uh, I think when I first started the journey two decades ago, of course, a lot of people were asked, like, why do you do that? Why green building? Why energy and all? So the answer uh, is very simple, you know, because um, building has uh, actually very high carbon impact in the world, accounting for about 40% of greenhouse gas emission globally. And uh, definitely, you know, we need to look at how we could design, build, and also manage building. 28% of this 40% actually is, you know, account, you know, is responsible, um, uh, uh, you know, for the operation of buildings. So you don't look at just new development, but also existing de uh, development, especially those, you know, buildings that are like 50, 60, or even older building they are not as efficient as you want it to be so there are a lot of complex issues that we have to look at and uh, just fast track to you know just summarize the climate pact cop 26 yeah i have the honors to be there personally and almost like wherever you turn you you, you look at you know, you, you get the word, you know, most popular word there is zero. Okay, it's like raised to zero, you know, zero carbon, everything it is about zero. And uh, actually, uh, the raised to zero was, um, you know, 
uh, I think the last two months prior to uh, COP26, uh, it really has gone up so fast. And uh, in a total, you know, I have some data to show you. Uh, it accounts for about 90% uh, of the whole world's GDP. So it is a really, really strong force for change. And uh, of course, in our building sector, we look at, you know, advancing net zero. Although we have actually started our green building journey more than two decades ago, and also consolidated our climax strategies and um, and the carbon policies in 2015 after Paris Agreement, we only dare to pledge for net zero this February, you know, just, a, you know, less than a year ago. So why we do it is because it is a necessary ambition, but we also need to be prudent as a company, as a listed company, especially. So we are not setting goals that is that we can, you know, close one eye, we can achieve it, but we also need to set ambitious target and also know our pathway, whether it is viable for us to work towards it in the next decade. In fact, we have one year less already, only nine years now. So I think um, I will elaborate a little bit more, but uh, we have actually seen the, you know, the growth of a net zero carbon building commitment uh, advocated by World Green Building Council. And uh, uh, after three years, we have actually achieved about, you know, about 156 companies signed on to this net zero. And uh, during Corp, we actually out of this 156, uh, 44 companies make the further step to commit, you know, uh, the whole life cycle. Just now, uh, one of our speakers talked about body carbon scope three, which is very important, not just about what we generate, what we, you know, tap onto the grid, but also have to look at our supply chain. And then, of course, uh, we have also seen some, you know, ASEAN, you know, activities, you know, uh, the presence has gone up also in this, uh, this is COP. And uh, we actually, in, uh, on the 10th of November, ASEAN launched, uh, you know, taxonomy, which is a really good step for, you know, a good guide for sustainable finance. And of course, we also look at, you know, circular economy as, an, uh, as a region. And uh, last but not least, actually, um, Finance, you know, financial, you know, uh, uh, stakeholders are at the core to drive change. So, as a business, we need financial support from the banks, from investors, you know, especially just listed company like us, and of course insurers. Because just now I think uh, someone talked about stranded, you know, uh, 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 assets and all. So we have to also look at the whole life cycle. You know, how we, what we acquire and how we design. And um, uh, next to the sea, you know, having open sea view may not be the best in, uh, you know, investment if you don't look at rising sea level. Yeah, so I think uh, there are a lot more that we have to look at nowadays. And of course, uh, we also have our Singapore Green Climb, which actually, you know, also translated into uh, more stringent regulation, you know, changes in, you know, um, uh, transition risks as well. And uh, next slide, please. So just now I talk about race to zero, and you can see the number is very interesting now that, you know, more than, you know, thousand cities and, you know, um, 6,000 over businesses, investors, and then we're still counting. And all together, it represents about 90% of greenhouse um, um, GDP in the world and about 80% of greenhouse gas emission. And you can see that on the right-hand side, you can see that everybody is, almost every sector is on what um, energy, you know, uh, uh, sector, investors, and uh, they are the one that was going to really drive and, uh, you know, give pressure to uh, investing company, you know, to drive change. And of course, investors' voices has been very, very clear and loud. And, um, you know, if you recall, uh, even January, um, uh, uh, Larry Fink in his letter to CEO, which is always an annual letter to set the direction of ESG investing. What he is asking for is no longer about just climate strategy. What he is asking for is invested and the extent investing company are expected to have a net zero strategy. If not, you are going to be risk being divested or your directors being outvoted. So it is very, very clear now. Not just the science is clear, the financials, is, you know, um, the benefits is also very clear. And uh, next slide, please. So um, definitely we see all these number. You can see that whether it is on the government level, business level, all these are actually, you know, um, uh, stepping up very, very fast. And uh, it is going to be mandatory or it's already happening, you know, uh, UK already, Canada, UK, New Zealand has already made it, you know, mandatory. And of course, just now we talk about uh, SGX also announced it, you know, in the three years phase into 
you know, TCFD, you know, as mandatory requirement for climate uh, disclosure already. So nowadays, I think very few companies or businesses will ask why we have to do it. And uh, in the good old day, when I first started the journey, I still feel that, you know, I still remember people would say, oh, ESG, climate, all these are non-financial. All these are good to have, but not today. Today, definitely everyone is talking about, hey, how can we step up? If I could look, go to the next slide, just to show the, you know, a bit of business case that um, the good news is, is viable. We have actually uh, very honest to have started the journey, you know, 26 years ago, and we have step by step and then, you know, fulfilling what we, what we are advocating today as a mainstream agenda. In 1995, we actually established our ethos of conserving as we construct, because we knew that uh, developer, uh, developer building sectors all have very high impact on the environment and on the community at large as well. So, and then over the two decades, we actually expanded and grew and, uh, you know, embraced best practices, uh, including like even um, integrated reporting approach, making financial and business sense of ESG. And of course, just now, Melissa talked about CDP. Carbon disclosure is very important. That helps us because what get measured, get managed. So that helps us to identify gaps and also come up with strategy, looking at how we can improve on climate and, and uh, carbon, uh, um, you know, uh, um, management. So in 20, um, actually, um, if you look at this, this particular slide that I am showing, uh, the last at the bottom of it are all the, you know, all the hot, hot numbers and uh, uh, digit, you know, uh, acronyms that we have been looking at. And uh, CDP, we started reporting since 2010. And uh, you can see that it is really a long journey. And we have actually learned and picked up a lot of important uh, tips that we, how to improve our strategy, how to improve our operational performance. And of course, SDG since 2016, we have embraced, uh, we started with nine goals and now 14 goals. TCFD, we started as one of the earliest adopter in Singapore in 2017. And the science-based target is very important because uh, we actually set the SBTI uh, validated target in 2018 based on two degree scenario. But after the IPCC fifth report that talking about 1.5, we actually have submitted to you know uh, SBTI. We are at the final stage of getting approval for the target, renew target uh, based on 1.5 degree. So these are the, you know, you, you can't just stay still. Whatever you do, you know, it's a journey. And the, the pace of change is getting faster and faster because now we are in in the race to zero. So we need to really step up. And of course, uh, investors are all looking at the financial impact and CSP, CDSP are all really focused on what investors really want. And of course, we have been uh, you know, a, a, a big adopter of GRI since 2008, because what we feel is business of business is not just about you know, money, profits and all, we have to look at the bigger picture, you have to look at multi-stakeholder approach, you have to look at, you know, not just financial, but bigger than that, the planet, the people, the human rights, the neighbour and, and all. So that's why we have been adopting the GRI standard as a core standard and plus all these seven framework and benchmark and all, which is actually very close to what TCFD is actually advocating. I like the four pillars because I think, uh, especially strategy, and then we don't look at backward number. We also always look at forward. I'll, I'll share a little bit more. But just to look at, uh, you know, share that we have four strategic pillars that underpin our ESG strategy. That is the four I, which some of the speaker has already talking about. We can't work in silo. ESG has to be truly integrated into the business, vertically from the board to the top management, mid management, all the way down to the operational unit. Horizontally, we cut across all business and you know operational unit. You can't just do it alone as a sustainability team. You just do it alone. What about our project development team? What about our uh, asset management team? And even our uh, HR, you know, customer relations, IR. Everybody must come on board to know what is the strategy. And for reporting, is no longer an operational, you know, uh, uh, communication tool. We use it as a strategic communication tool with our investors and all. And uh, we actually issue our, you know, sustainability blueprint in twenty fifteen. 
2017, setting goals and targets that align with global goals, and uh, you know, really looking forward to you know the future rather than looking backward. And uh, of course, we also embrace the net zero. Next target, uh, next slide, please. So the after integration, we also not think about innovation, investment, and also impact. So in the end of the day, what are we delivering? There are three deliverable, which is decarbonization. You need to decarbonize because whichever uh, sector you are in, especially those with high impact, like you know our building sector or transport and, 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 and industry, all have to set that decarbonization as top priority. And then digitalization is very important. Just now, I think you know one of the speakers also talked about AI. Big data is very important. Without data, without knowing where you are, you can't talk about the future. And uh, risk mitigation is a given. We are looking at risk adaptation we are looking at application of innovation technology solutions yeah then of course last but not least is we have to disclose because you can't just hide all data and I, I can't tell you you know because investors multi-stakeholders want data and want you to communicate promptly and regularly so that's why in a, uh, over and above of our annual sustainability report since 2008 uh, we have actually you know also step up. Uh, since 2017, we have a sustainability uh, website, a dedicated website, and uh, plus a quarterly report on our, you know, on our uh, key goals and target. So uh, investor can just log in anytime to look at the performance. And I think we can't do it alone. Nobody can save the world alone. We have to engage the whole value chain. And uh, as the, you know, when we acquired the uh, acquired, uh, uh, land, and uh, when we design, and we have to already engage everyone, you know, the architect, the designer, the uh, engineer, and uh, of course, during building, we must also engage our main contractors, subcontractors, supply chain. We talk about scope three, sustainable building materials play a huge part in this. So these are all, you know, the whole value chain is very complex and everybody must come on board to know where we are heading and uh, including our building users and also tenants and, uh, you know, um, uh, home buyers as well. Uh, next slide, please. So we talk about the four I, very important. Without that, we can't really have a very clear ESG strategy. And we talk about the three deliverable. And now it's like, how do we, you know, disclose and share the impact? So these are the few pages that we actually, I extracted it from our integrated sustainability report. We have to look at good governance. You have to look at, you know, the business approach. Setting target is very important. Without setting the direction, it's like your, your GPI, without knowing where you are you know, going, you, you will be going all over the place. Yeah, so uh, this is actually our sustainability blueprint, the three key targets, which is actually integrated with our SDGs as, as well, uh, looking at building sustainable city, not just concrete building, but also community, people is very important. And we're also talking about reducing environmental impact, not just about energy, but also looking at other resources as well, you know, whether it is water and also other aspects and uh, looking at not just our headquarters but also an individual asset level as well and the third goal is actually ensuring fair safe and inclusive workplace in the end of the day we are all working you know to build community to build people and uh, next slide please so um, integration is just so key that we really need to see how we can embrace everything. So GCFD really had the four pillars is very important. The matrix and target is, is almost like we can draw the, you know, um, uh, a similar uh, approach with CDP, with also GRASP, with, you know, all some of other ratings and ranking. And uh, most importantly is how do we align it with our material issues? So these are all, you know, embraced and integrated and interconnected together. So I like the you know the best amongst the four pillar of TCFD is about strategy because governance and risk management are actually given. So strategy help us to look at every aspect of you know and in our report we look at actual example like for example governance. Uh, top management leadership board commitment is very important. So for my portfolio, I'm very, very fortunate. I only report to the board sustainability committee comprising uh, three independent director and the executive director. So I have the, you know, um, the fortune of the, you know, direction and advice from the strategic level, the board level. And I also have the group CEOs to give me the operational support as well. And I also chair internally the sustainability committee that cut across all business and operational units. So we 
we are independent, empowered, but we are also integrated. So that's how the governance structure works and all the management are okay. So I think I will just quickly go to the next few slides uh, because of the time constraint. Um, maybe the uh, next slide, all these are actually on our sustainability you know, uh, uh, website. And then the strategy, we look at some of the, you know, what you must look at numbers and also performance. We can't just say that, yeah, we have a strategy, but you can't tell people what you are, are looking at. So now we are looking at 1.5 degree, we are looking at, you know, uh, working towards net zero. And you also have to show the pathway as well. Uh, next couple of slides, please. Yeah. And integration is so important that you can see that how we actually align with our top material issues. Every year since 2014, we conduct uh, our annual uh, materiality study because there are so many things under the sun you want to report, but you need to stay, stay focused. What we think internally and also external stakeholder wants, we focus on all those top ESG issues and how do we identify risks and opportunities and how do we respond to it and what are the you know, accomplishments and impact is very important i think we i still have one or two more slides we need next slide please yeah so um yeah so we look at activities output value created and also what are the overall impact and tied in with all the you know the acronyms that you know you love them you hate them you know sometimes they give you so much stressful night yeah uh, next slide please i think um we also need to look at like um forward looking is very important i really like the you know uh, climate change scenario planning in fact we conducted our very first one in 2018 based on 2 degree and then now then after the uh, IPCC report saying oh, folks you have to look at 1.5 then we actually went back to the drawing board in 2019 we actually look at uh, 1.5 and 2 degree in 2020 about mid 2020 um, we were about to finish but we were not happy with the, the, the study because the disruption caused by COVID we cannot neglect it so we actually starting now uh, on, on our third uh, report now a uh, third study on climate change and climate change related you know impact on the transition train uh, transition risk as well as physical risk we can't say that pandemic has no impact on us because the disruption of material workers has actually caused everything you know to a stop so we are looking at climate change scenario also looking at you know the social aspect as well uh, the last two slides please yeah so uh, we also look at business impact. This is also, you know, reported every year. And now we are, we are very proud to be engaging our tenants. We have our green lease since 2017, 100% participation. And that shows that, you know, the whole value chain, whether you're building users and whether you're a supplier must be on board. And we also support and, and with data that every year we save about three to uh, uh, close to 4 million in terms of energy savings. And uh, apart from saving, we also look at the future and uh, the last slide, please. Um, we look at branding. We look at endorsement because to us, branding and trust from investors and stakeholders are most important. And uh, these are the independent ratings and rankings that uh, you know a lot of people are very familiar with. Uh, apart from CDP, we are very proud to be the A-list, maintaining it for four consecutive years. We also on uh, MSCI for 10, 11 years now, triple A rating. So we are not here just to sit in exam every year to, to chase for the number. But these are all independent and uh, you know data actually based on publicly available information from our mainly our sustainability report. So for corporate, you know, reporter, do put effort in your, you know, ESG disclosure and sustainability report. These is a report. This is a report card that help us to open door for sustainable finance and also tap onto the very fast growing ESG investing. And uh, I think this will be my last slide now. And I uh, hope you know TCFD is different, definitely a rising star, but it also works closely together, integrated with the other like you know GRI, SSB, and uh, you know all the other you know um, CDB, SPTI, all the very important you know acronyms that. That is our life now because if we don't have a healthy planet, we don't have healthy healthy people and market to help business to thrive and uh, you know communities to 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 stay prosper, uh, prosper, uh, prosperous. Yeah, with that, thank you. Thank you very much, Esther. You're so passionate uh, about 
you know, the work that you do. And I really appreciate and also want to congratulate CDL for, for all the excellent work. So I know that we've already exceeded our time, but I would like to uh, just take two questions very quickly. Uh, and these are in the Q&A box. So David and Elson's questions uh, will be answered live and the rest of them, uh, be assured we will get to them and we'll find a way to, to email the questions, uh, the answers to some of you. Um, so for the first question, David has asked, uh, what will be your advice on how banks or financial institutions can approach their corporate climate action when they're not only accountable for their own carbon emission in their business or climate actions, but they're also in a position to provide finance to their clients who can also be in a carbon intensive industry. And I believe Robin will be taking this question. Oh, Actually, Yulia, sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. Yes, <laughs> Yulia. Will I'll get the second one. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Sorry no about that. Uh, that. That's an excellent question. And uh, we often face the, this uh, with financial institutions, not just banks. Well, in fact, uh, that's what uh, Robin presented in his part. Uh, there are different approaches to how you assess TCFD, uh, um, like how you do risk assessment and disclose under TCFD for corporates and for financial institutions. This is where the portfolio analysis comes handy. So you really look into the uh, pockets of risks uh, along different sectors or portfolio companies or products um, that you have and then um, do strategic approach and engagement with respective high risk sectors or companies uh, that, that, that uh, are under your portfolio. And um, I would like to refer to one of the projects that IRM has done with GP Morgan Chase actually, uh, it's called Carbon Compact. Uh, Compass. So um, it's available on the website. You can uh, check on that. And it provides a very good and interesting framework for financial institutions and banks in the first place, how to address uh, climate risks in a comprehensive manner. Oh, hang on. I, I'm on mute. Sorry. I'll, thanks, Yulia. I'll post post the link, I'll look it up and post it uh, in the chat in a short while. Um, Robin, can you take Elson's question on Hong Kong? Yeah, sure. So the, the, the guidance from the SFC is specifically around the scope one and two emissions from the portfolio companies that you're invested in. Um, it's not looking at it from the point of view of scope three emissions. So the only thing they want you to address at this stage is just the scope one and two emissions from the portfolio companies. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so I think that's all the time we have uh, for this uh, webinar. Thank you everyone for your excellent and thought provoking questions. Uh, I enjoyed the discussion and the sharing very much. Uh, but as you know, we've exceeded our time allocation and I apologize that we're not able to take all of the questions. Um, but thank you for joining us wherever you are in the world and for your active listening. Uh, we would like to, uh, pre, uh, to have you feedback to us. So if Bradley can just share the final slide, which is the QR code. Uh, if you have any further questions or like to give us feedback on how we can improve, uh, please scan the QR code uh, on this slide. Uh, I, either, yeah, I don't know if there's a QR code or whether there's just the email addresses of our speakers. Um, but anyway, the, I, I, don't, I can't recall. But anyway, here are the, the speakers. Uh, email addresses. So now it just leaves me to thank our speakers for this webinar, uh, Yulia, Robin, and Sina, as well as Esther from CDL. Thank you very much for sharing your expert knowledge with us. And to all of you, stay safe, keep fighting the good fight, uh, and enjoy the upcoming weekend and holiday season. Thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks, Melissa. Thank you, Melissa.